Hi, everybody. This is Dave Sheehan from The Connect Show. In this episode, we are concentrating, focusing on research with Nikki Monk and also Amy Steele talking all things research. Stand by. Welcome to Power Diary. As you launch into our software, you're powering up your practice with the most efficient tools at your fingertips. We're here to streamline your scheduling, simplify your client communications, and support your clinic's growth every step of the way. So let's power up your practice and dive right in to Power Diary. My name is Amy Steele. I'm from the Australian Research Consortium in Complementary and Integrative Medicine at UTS. And I'm here with my dear friend and colleague, Nikki Monk from um, Indiana University to have a talk for um, the Connect program, the Connect community for the Massage and My Therapy Association. So hello, Nikki, it's lovely to see you. Hey there, Amy, it's great to see you as well. I am really, excited about this conversation because we're taking a little bit of a of a different spin on this connect interview or dialogue that we've had in the past and this is stemming from a conversation that we were having a little a little while ago about some of the new sorts of challenges that we're experiencing in the research realm um, that's particularly facing survey research and potentially even interviews when honorariums and similar sorts of awards or monetary aspects are introduced or used as honorariums or incentive to participate in research. And so we thought as we were having the dialogue and conversation about it, thought that this might be of interest to our Connect colleagues and the Connect audience. And so we've put together just a series of points to talk about a little bit of what the issue is, how we discovered it, and some of our personal experiences with these challenges to research integrity and uh, participation. Yeah, that's 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 the plan. And, and as you say, I mean, the survey and interview research is very important for, um, for many health professions. It's not just clinical research. Survey and interview research can get us, give us an idea of what patients and practitioners um, are thinking and what they're doing and um, help us to understand a little bit more about how those behaviours relate to one another. Um, and there's lots of other aspects of survey and interview research that can answer really important questions for the massage therapy community. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and survey research is of particular interest to us, given our connection with the practice-based research networks, you with your Pracky in Australia and me with MassageNet in the United States and North America. Well, actually, we've got participants for another Connect call. We have participants from all over the world now. Um, 
but we are couched a lot in this survey research. Um, and there's in some opportunities or with research, there's um, the use of honorariums with whether it be gift cards or other, you know, $25 or $50 or, or similar um, incentives that will happen after either through a drawing or after an interview, which was the case with us. We had interviews that were happening after a survey. So we had a survey that went out and then folks who would be interested in also providing an interview would leave their contact information. And then everybody who participated in the interview would receive an honorarium. So it's a very standard practice to use these honorariums. Um, there's, there's balance that goes along with that from a, a thank you for your time and your contribution um, and balancing that so it's not such an award or such an amount that could be considered co uh, coercive, where somebody will participate for the incentive and maybe not get genuine responses. Um, mm -hmm. But then depending on what those honorarium amounts are, it might not be relative um, from an insignificant amount, depending on where it's coming from, right? Absolutely. Um, right. And so, and I think, I mean, it's it's obviously an important, now important part of research, and it's not really an optional part of research either. It's an expectation from ethics committees that if we're um, taking up people's time, that there is some recognition of the that, that places on them. Anything, in a, um, if, and if it's just to cover, um, if it's an in-person interview, the cover, cover the cost of their time, to um to get to where they're going and and any potential travel parking costs whatever that may be but also even if it's just an online survey or interview just recognizing that there's time involved as and with surveys it's more often as you say like prize draws where you sort of could go into the draw to win a, a voucher probably from a slightly larger amount of money mm -hmm. and um and then um if it's an, an interview it's usually just a, a direct reimbursement um of you know a certain amount could be $30, $50, something like that. It's it's not usually a large amount of money because you say it's finding that balance between recognition of the of the potential burden and, and impact it has on the person without being seen to be highly coercive. Um, but this is where we've started to run into issues because that's all determined on the economy of the place where the research is being conducted. And so for you know, me in Australia, $30 or $50 for just for someone to spend an hour or so of their time is to con would can be considered to be enough, but not too much, and that would be a totally appropriate. But if I, um, if that thirty or fifty dollars Australian was made available to someone from a very low income country, or elsewhere that um, where the economy is very different, that money would actually mean a lot to them. Absolutely, um, and so and this combined with so this is a standard research practice, and as technology and information sharing and all manner of other rise of internet presence and things are occurring, we're finding that there are um, increased opportunities for things like bots and scammers and people with perhaps disingenuous motives or intentions replying to surveys or engaging in research for those honorariums and incentives. And these are some of the things that you and I have personally run into and that um, also there's, it's starting to show up a little bit in the literature as well of folks having conversations about the story um, or about, about these situations and trying to figure out ways to balance combating this with still also keeping the integrity of the research and the ethics around human subject research, even at the survey level and interview level um, and balancing how to uh, weed out these disingenuous actors um, or or programmed bot scams. Absolutely, and I'm, I think one of the things that it, that adds another layer to this is that the use of it's very common, particularly if you're trying to recruit people from the general population mm -hmm. um, to use social media to promote and and get the information out. If you to go, if it's not a particular illness population where you can go to a support network that might have an email list or a particular profile, or if it's not a particular practitioner population where you can go to a particular organization or association, 
um, where if you really are going to the general population, it's particularly marked because you don't really have a lot of other options to get the word out there. People don't read newspapers in the same way anymore. It's it's not like you can just get on the radio the way they used to. Even people aren't listening to the radio the way they used to. They're listening to mm -hmm. streaming music services and things. So we really are relying a lot on social media to get the word out. And where that leaves us is anyone being able to see these recruitment material and deciding to, um, uh, I guess, uh, make use of the situation and try and, and scam the the, um, the research. So both Nikki and I had just been having a conversation in, in one of our other meetings about different things, and we realised we both had very similar experiences recently. And we have other colleagues who have also had similar experiences and we thought it's really important to kind of bring this to, to the uh, awareness of the community. So, Nikki, why don't you tell us your little story about what, what happened with you? Sure. We had a research design that included putting out a survey, and that was getting a lot of basic information from folks. We were wanting to just general people who have received massage. Um, and we had some validated measures that we had included in the survey for our particular population um, or our topic of interest that we were wanting to learn about for people who would receive massage. And we were really excited when after just a couple of emails out to our, our network that was asking it, the link and the opportunity to be shared amongst client lists and other colleagues, social media, all manner of different ways to put this out for word of mouth. And we received a really robust response. And because we were perhaps a little naive and excited in the moment, um, and we know that some, in, when a survey really hits a chord, it might very well get a, a nice robust response. Um, and so we proceeded with the idea that these were all genuine and we had no reason to believe otherwise in that moment. And we went ahead and proceeded with starting to clean the data that was coming in and particularly looking at those who indicated that, yes, they would be interested in a follow-up interview. That was the next steps and stages of the study and conducted one interview, conducted actually three total interviews, one that seemed very not out of the ordinary. Um, but then the second survey, um, or excuse me, the second interview was they were all um, they were all video interviews via Zoom or or similar. And the person wasn't turning on their camera, which isn't necessarily it wasn't required, and that happens certainly for for various reasons. And the interviewer went up proceeded, had a conversation with this individual, um, nothing terribly out of the ordinary, and then concluded that interview to start another interview the next day where some similarities were starting to show up. Again, the camera wasn't coming on. Um, and then noticing that this was the second interview in a row that had a very strong accent different from a North American accent that we would have ex particularly expected given that one of the inclusion criteria was we were looking at individuals who had received massage in the United States. Um, and so, and while we have people with all manner of different um, accents that live in the States, that was just another bit of a, of a, it was enough of a similarity that raised a little bit of a flag and um, when the interviewer came and talked to me about it, just, you know, I happen to have this noticing, what do you think about it? It triggered a memory that I had with some other colleagues that was doing educational research that was looking, um, that had put a call out, an international call out for educators and looking at the scholarship of teaching and learning and were doing, conducting interviews with professors and they had they were talking about how they had realized that they had been um, involved in and that they had a very high honorarium where it was about seventy five dollars or a hundred dollars for all of these interviews, and they realized that it was the same individuals um, from Nigeria actually that were calling in and doing these interviews, and they the voices were changing a little bit, but they got like fifteen interviews in before they realized that they were interviewing the same 
people over and over again who wouldn't turn their cameras on um, and mm -hmm. they weren't professors. And so it just, all these different things were triggered and happenstance that then when we went and looked at the survey metrics for timing for when these the original surveys were going out, that it was essentially we got like 400 hits within a, I don't know, two or three hour time frame where there were submissions happening every minute, just all in a row um, for hours on end. And it was um, realizing it was at odd hours of the night for us. So let us know that they were coming in from different parts of the world and likely from an AI generation. Yeah, that's so, it's so similar to our experience. I mean, we had some yeah. aspects of ours in which we had um, a, a sim we had a similar situation. We had a survey and followed up by interviews. Um, and in the survey, we also had a prize draw for the survey in, in addition to registering to potentially be interviewed in, as a follow up. And so there was we actually had three different surveys linked to the same study, and um, um, we had the same thing where we had. Um, a lot of surveys, uh, survey responses come in overnight at really odd hours. Um, we do a lot of surveys, as you know, through Arkham. It's a it's a massive part of our research, and so we we that alerted us very quickly. It seemed highly unusual to have a look to see email uh, survey responses coming in between one at one a.m., one thirty two, one thirty five, one thirty seven, and we thought, oh, hang on, this isn't right. Um, and then the, the the linked survey where people could register for the prize draw, there were lots of email addresses that didn't in any way match the names that they were providing. There were lots of phone numbers that were US phone numbers, like one after the other after the other, even though we were recruiting Australian participants. Um, and, the, and, and those three things happening all in the same responses to someone using a very anglicised name, a very... Uh, blind email address it could be anything like some numbers and a few random letters and an american phone number all happening we went hang on this isn't right um and then yeah so we, we were able to pick up on that very quickly but it did also leave us with the issue of having to try and link back to the survey responses that had the false registered um and prize draw entries and trying to figure out which ones were actually the ones that were the false ones, and that was a really difficult thing to do. Um, and you know, we've we've went through a process of kind of figuring, looking at timestamps and and those kinds of things, but it wasn't wasn't very easy to sort of work through all of that. And uh, time consuming for sure, highly time consuming. And we've also had similar issues with our um, uh, with focus groups. We've been doing mixed focus group recruitment at the moment, and it's been for in person or online. And a lot of people have been opting for online, um, and um, and then people talking about the reimbursements and those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, I think that there's it's added a layer of complexity that's made us have to rethink our research practice around yeah. this because. It is really important that we are um, recognizing people's time, that researchers aren't getting all the benefit, and that uh, from participating from the research, and that the participants get the general benefit of we are answering a research question that might benefit their community of patients or the, the general population. But they're actually they're the ones who are giving up their time, not everybody, and so there should be something for them. So not losing that part of it, but finding a way to, to address some of that, and so. Um, there's a number of different ways that we've kind of had to work through to come up with, to figure out how are we going to move forward with this. Social media is still the most efficient option that we have for recruitment of the general population. We can't really find another avenue. So that one's staying. So how do we work with social media and still collect reliable data, recruit appropriate people um, and, and manage all of that? So... Yeah, I mean, you've you these... got a few things on that, haven't you, Nikki? I've got a few as well. Right. So there's there's some things that the different platforms that conduct the survey research or that you know we we put these put the research out through have some features that have been activated or are um, incorporated into those platforms to help identify these pieces, whether it be um, like IP address scans. Um, documentation aspects, 
adding other sorts of layers of questions that ultimately down the line um, will have to be adjusted as the disingenuous actors or AI gets more advanced to where it can fight through these. I mean, there's as simple as some of those questions that we would see at, at surveys that we take just in general online to indicate that you're not, I am not a robot, check this box or, you know, identify, uh, yeah. signify which blocks in this picture include bikes or something like that, right? That they're, that the assumption is that if that is answered appropriately, that is filtering out the bots. Um, and then just ending the survey for those that respond in that way, you know, in the, in the way that doesn't indicate that they are human real and moving on. So finding ways to um, confirm the identity, either the identity of the individual, which in some cases isn't desired mm -hmm. because of confidentiality reasons or um, identifying information, um, or indicating that they are most likely not a bot just filling in the responses. So yeah. those are the pieces that we've started to incorporate um, and also not advertising as heavily any of the honorariums or the or the amounts. Yeah, we've we've started to have that mid mid recruitment for one of our projects because we started to notice recruiting for these focus groups, these online in person focus groups that there was we were still getting this this potential this these questionable responses that were making us feel uncertain about the their um validity. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we tried doing was just taking out mention of any honorarium in the advertisement material. And so it's only when people clicked on the link and went to the the information sheet that they saw that there was an honorarium. And um, of course, that's going to mean that some people are less likely to follow through if they don't realize that there is an honorarium. But it also in some ways might mean that it's the people who are most likely interested in participating who are going to at least click in to see the, what the rest of that information. And so, and that seems to have tempered things a little bit. So just simply taking out clear information about the financial components seems to definitely help. We also had an issue where one of the links to the survey, one of our prize draw surveys was overtaken, but somehow they got a hold of that link, which wasn't actually advertised. It was only a link that you could access once you completed the survey and they managed to get the link to the mains, to oh. the prize draw. And so we ended up with twice as many people registering for the prize draw than had actually um, completed the survey. Um, oh, so did you did you have to go through and first weed out the pieces that didn't have a corresponding link in the survey and yeah. then weed yeah. out the survey? Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So we're, uh, but you're right. So the survey platforms are quite uh, are trying to adapt to this as quickly as they can. One of the other things that we've actually had to do is go through the surveys themselves. And this is generally good survey practice, um, but to actually check the responses to make sure that they make sense. Mm -hmm. um, to, and of course, you know, not and, and being as generous as we can so that we're we're not just disregarding um, surveys that responses that we don't like. But if someone identifies that they have 15 health conditions, through two of with one being a female reproductive, another being a male reproductive system, and also provide a quality of life score that indicates that they're very healthy, happy, and balanced, then there's there's that sets off some alarm bells. Um, and so just checking, and also if, if people are just giving the same answer every single one, so they call it straight lining. And so mm -hmm. again, it's time consuming. It means going through every response and just checking that there's nothing in there that is glaringly, obviously problematic. So yeah, it yes. makes it a bit more interesting. And this is part of the what one of the reasons why survey research is probably one of, I think, one of the most underestimated methodologies in research. Um, there's just... There's layers of complexity to writing a good question, survey question and, and getting the right people to respond to it um, and making sure that the data that you're analyzing and reporting is actually reliable. Absolutely. A survey research is some of my favorite for those very complexities because it makes it keeps it it keeps it very engaging um, yeah. and it puts those mental acuity pieces to work, particularly when crafting those questions and making sure the responses are actually what we're wanting to elicit from folks, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the fun of it, isn't it? It's like, how am I going to ask a question that's going to actually get the information that I'm looking for and not 
accidentally ask people something else entirely so right it's interpreted a whole different way and they're they're thinking they're answering the question and it's not but that's, that's, another, that's, that's another connect it, it is it <laughs> is yes I was I was just thinking that same thing well I hope that this conversation I I, I think it's incredibly interesting um just sort of a little bit of the behind the scenes but also as another reminder to when you are um particularly from a massage and myotherapy standpoint, when you are invited to participate in research, whether it be survey or otherwise, that you are eligible for, that your voice is so important and, and matters. And we just want to give that extra encouragement um, to participate and help with snowball efforts, if you will, which is you're letting others know and bringing others with you that you know might be interested and eligible to participate in those endeavors. It's good for the community and building us up and also in providing that very much needed perspective and information about our field. So true. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's been so lovely with you. I know I love having these opportunities to connect with you in these recordings for the of Australia Massage and Myotherapy. Yeah, thank you. All right, when, uh, we'll speak soon and um, have a, I'm sure we'll have another chat about something else for people coming up. Absolutely. See you later. Bye.